yet. It's still showing the... Um, okay, now I should be able... Okay, perfect. We are, we are live. Okay. All right. Um, welcome, everyone, uh, and thank you for, uh, for joining today's lecture. So before I'm going to introduce our distinct, uh, distinguished speaker today, I would like to once again um, acknowledge our lecture series in which we were fortunate to bring some of the most brilliant architects from around the world to our school. Uh, so in previous lectures, we had a uh, uh, privilege to have uh, Professor Reinhardt from MIT giving a lecture. We had the privilege of having Wolf Briggs, which is the principal of Coupillon Blau. Uh, then we had also Anton Picon uh, two weeks ago from Harvard uh, GS, uh, GSD. And today we have our distinguished speaker, Patrick Schumacher. And uh, the following lecture, uh, we are going to uh, conclude this uh, lecture series with Daniel Adams from uh, Landing Studio. So I think from an educational perspective, this list of lectures represent a very invaluable asset and I think a great opportunity uh, for which we are very grateful. Um, so it's a pleasure for me to welcome Patrick Schumacher. Uh, he's someone that I believe does not need the introduction, uh, but I'm going to, uh, to give a sort of small introduction for those of you that maybe are not familiar with some of his contribution to the uh, uh, architectural discourse. So Patrick, he, he's the principal of Zadid Architects, uh, which he joined in uh, 1988 and since uh, been the author of many key projects such as Maxi Museum in Rome, uh, Dong de Gon uh, Design Center, Gonzo uh, Opera House, uh, Les uh, Sour, uh, uh, Soho Tower in Beijing, and Beijing uh, Daxing International Airport, just to name a few. And I'm sure that he's going to show today many other like amazing work uh, done uh, at Zadid Architects. Uh, so of course, the list of uh, awards I think, again, it's something that is too long to share, but I think one particular um, one can be mentioned. In 2010, he won the Royal Institute of British Architects Sterling Prize for Excellence in Architecture. Uh, so Patrick has always been uh, this kind of very brilliant proponent of experimentation in architecture, uh, both when we speak about uh, academia and also practice. Uh, and he also founded uh, ADRL which is Architectural Association Design Research Lab in London 22 years ago, where he continues to teach to this day. Uh, he held uh, multiple uh, teaching positions. Uh, to mention a few, uh, he was uh, appointed the first John Portman Chair in Architecture at uh, GSD. Uh, he was also a tenure professor at Innsbruck University. He got taught a series of postgraduate studios with Zahadid at University of Illinois, at Chicago, Columbia University, and the GSD. He also co-taught with Zahadid in Studio Hadid Vienna at the Angevante, where I also personally had the privilege of having him as uh, him and Zaha as professors. Uh, currently, he's also a, a guest professor at the Angevante, uh, where I actually had the pleasure to collaborate with him as a researcher on the agent-based parametric semiology research project and also where I have him as a PhD supervisor. Uh, following up on his passion for experimentation and this kind of push for boundaries uh, of practice as, as well as academia and debate, uh, it's my pleasure to have him here at our School of Architecture. And uh, please join me in uh, thanking Patrick for joining us. Thank you, Patrick. Hi, hi guys. Good to see you <laughs> and thanks for inviting me. I don't know how much time I have. Um, it could be about an hour, what I might take. Okay. Uh, that's okay. Um, but uh, um, And I've put something together, particularly for you guys and your work, Daniel, and what I guess you're trying to do with, with your students in terms of the uh, particular AI research and the new processes you're experimenting with and how one could reflect um, the status of these researches, what one hopes to achieve, and some methodological reflections, and um, also how how where this how this fits into a historical trajectory. So I have 
I'm, I'm a supporter of the work and the research. I also have some kind of questions and, and, and uh, doubts about it as well. <laughs> so <laughs> but, um, that will come through and we can discuss afterwards. So, um, but I think it's an overall, it's positive. And the title is geared to that. I'm talking about, uh, you know, formal research and that's a particular uh, important type of research which isn't always recognized because there's a prejudice against form and so-called formalism in architecture as being something superficial and and uh, uh, just, uh, you know, something self-indulgent and, uh, you know, compared to play, but we, we should, and it is to some extent play, but play, <laughs> play is something very productive. So uh, that's the point, uh, keep one of the points I'm going to make. So let me just uh, try to uh, share my screen, wait. I'm going here, share and... Um, uh, do you have also some audio, like some uh, music? No, I don't think okay. I have audio. So formal research, research and the avant-garde. So the notion of the avant-garde is of interest, um, like form and formalism, it's also been kind of trashed and, and questioned. Um, it ties in with um, art movements as well. And I think this is also showing, in a way, with, with your current research, there's a connection with artistic research and artists who are in, the, in that similar domain to some extent of formal research. And I also describe what contemporary art and modern art and contemporary art um, have to offer and can offer, what societal meaning or function of these avant-garde and art um, movements. But I want to start with this, um, what the successful design in the end is some kind of fitness, a form function fit. And the function is uh, obviously something we are tasked to address. So that comes from society, uh, let's say the external reference, the world reference. And then the form is our contribution, actually our solution medium. That's why it's important that we work on that. Sometimes also you work on the, on the toolbox and expand that and it becomes a separate project. So form function fit and there are two roots to when you work on projects um, in, in terms of innovative um, solutions. Um, one is you start with forms, new forms, search for problems they can solve. That I think is possible in academia and AADRL was always based on that. And so was to some extent Vienna, where we have we do have a very broad, often problem domain which we identify. Maybe it's you know where we're doing we're talking about maybe an urban uh, scale, but then we don't have much more than that. And we then we're working on formal um, concepts or processes and design systems, and we develop those and their logic. And then we we look at what we can do with it. So it's a kind of what I call form to program heuristics. And uh, usually the, the other way around is that you start with a very well-defined problem and you develop a very precise brief and you know with the schedule of accommodation and lots of relationships you want to press. And then you, you try to find the forms which fulfill those functions. It's a professional route, um, mostly because you have, you have this precisely predefined brief. And you can you have to hit that. It's the opposite. But what I always find very important to reflect the symbiosis. You know, if you had why DRL is so important for ZHA is that we can um, generate and also Vienna as a second leg and a few Yale as a third leg as it were. That uh, we can you know can proliferate formal systems and we can then seek out what they could be useful for and we generate a kind of uh, form function um, um, fitness catalog, all innovation, and then we th then if, if that's broad enough, wide enough, and then we're facing a problem, we maybe can find um, a, a a solution in that in that research, and then we just you know refine that and make that precise. So that that's the <laughs> the the kind of interesting I would think that the, the useful framing of the idea of architectural research and also a bit 
the what is what is the division of labor between let's say an academic and a professional work and research as well uh, and somehow my personal reflection on our success um, a lot of that um, search process i mean when you generate a particular the form the the, um, the uh, Form the program is, is, is this variation, mutation, recombination. You play around um, and then you select, and that the selection takes place with, uh, you know, relative to a catalog potential functions. And the important thing is, as I said earlier, we don't, we haven't in that heuristics, we don't have predefined functions. We're functionalizing something. And actually, that's the way, and then we reproduce it maybe in the professional context. And the evolution works like this it, it comes with stuff. Uh, and and then that stuff is <laughs> meant to survive and reproduce and finds niches and the, the pieces which are part of the organism which in, in a new environment become kind of uh, refunctionalized and utilized anyway so creativity is, is an interesting one then uh, one part of creativity anyway is that random search nearly or that search uh, not totally random with various heuristics so it's mut mut mutation and alertness. A mutation and re recombination as well, like the evolutionary process. Uh, alertness with respect to a selection of new utilization kind of possibilities. Um, that's, that's creativity, but also, you know, the, uh, there's also, be, you have to say something else as well. So, and then seeing something as something else. When you, when you look at your proliferated forms, you start to see something what you know functional in it when it initially was produced without that through some other processes kind of blind processes but the blindness isn't absolute so uh, because when we are setting up certain formal researches we have a broad sense for instance that we're looking for complexity that there should be uh, you know a, you know, sort of gradients within that somehow that they could, should, and potentially could be overlap in the in the mix, um, and so we are not totally blind. Um, but then we're also allowing what Eisenman, uh, uh, you know, took from Deleuze and called the abstract machine. I mean, as 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 a kind of deliberate stepping away from preconceived notion, it's nearly kind of overcoming our already too far. Um, let's say, um, um, constra pre-constrained thinking about solutions, uh, where we have, where we're looking at precedents and, and um, known and fixed form functions, um, syntheses, which, which become stereotypes or types. When you think of, uh, you know, when you're thinking of the, uh, a house and you already have in, in mind a certain box with a roof and so on, these are the kind of these strong integrated form function complexes that need to be broken up. I mean, you set these pull apart form and function and allow the pull, you know <laughs> new forms to emerge. Anyway, so so this um, the reason is yeah we have these limitation of our imagination um, where we I mean that's in a way can only produce. What we've seen, we are imitation, you know, machines, and the imagining things we've seen, uh, maybe with slight variations, and therefore we need that surrender to an alien force, um, which refuses, which breaks that simply, and forces us out of that thinking in cliches, forcing the novel. That's and the novel, novelty is one necessary component of innovation. It's of course not sufficient. Mere novelty is just a curiosity and nine, maybe the, the majority of novel things are not innovations because they're, it would particularly if something highly evolved, that's a tough one because something more seeming more random would probably be um, a detraction. Anyway, so that alien force could be general algorithms could be Eisenman who did, he, he did this kind of pre-digital algorithms where he put himself under the spell of a rule uh, where he takes a cube and bites out a piece and rotates it and 
and then bites out another piece or puts the grid and shifts the grid and puts another grid and, and builds up complexity with, with uh, in a kind of quasi-mechanically. Um, anyway, so that's very important. And it's important to see generally stepping back that there's no way, particularly in the realm of, let's say, innovative, new problems, uh, et cetera, to infer the form from the function. Only in very narrow, prescribed conditions uh, where you nearly have already preconceived the form and you're just now looking at the dimensions or something, which you then derive from some kind of functional calculus. So that's very naive, this form follows function thing. As if, if you have the openness of the universe of forms, you cannot deduct from the function the form. You can only deduct um, it if you have a strong, what I call formal a priori, if you've pre-constrained the formal universe in which you search, uh, for instance, that you've already made, the made it clear as an a priori that you're only you're solving a layout um, that you're only walking, working with adjacent boxes. And then you, you even there, it's a lot of trial and error. It's difficult to, to, to in a sense, to calculate the solution. But, but there, there are certain examples where you don't want to go into it too much, where you can um, a, derive or deduce a, an optimal solution or good solution um, from the problem's parameters, um, ha having a kind of problem solving algorithm in steps, which um, where you derive the, the final co composition from the uh, problem statement, but that is uh, very exceptional. It requires, as I said, the, the, the clear uh, framing of the formal repertoire that comes to bear. And uh, of course, when we're talking about innovation, innovation and what you guys, for instance, are up to, you, you precisely that is not given. So I'm saying here, my thesis, there's always a formal a priori. Uh, all design starts with a given assumption, a repertoire vocabulary of forms. And, um, you know, and that's what those architects who are critical of formal explorations um, or they accuse people who have more rich formal repertoires of formalism as if we are in love with form for itself, et cetera, and that they are focusing their mind on the functional parameters um, they, what they forget is that they have prejudiced the formal repertoire strongly. So they have, they have pre-constrained, and that's not rational, that, they, that whatever the solution they are trying to find is within that, within that space of search. And that is, uh, and then, you know, leaving a, out a huge universe of other search spaces in which more optimal solutions probably are locatable. Um, so the beginning is arbitrary, often, I mean, in, in principle, of course, you could say these, these, these formal canons, which the more classical and modernist and so on architects work with, they have a kind of historically evolved rationale. Um, uh, but if they're not in a new historical stage, critically investigated, then they become dogmas. So this the, the, the solution to this kind of dilemma is that you have to have a deliberate and, and um, explicit project of expanding the repertoire um, of the, the search space in which you're looking for uh, compositional, architectural, or spatial solutions. The, form, the forms you might want to uh, bring to bear to solve the, the functional um, uh, task and problem. So, so every form of repertoire opens up and let's say a opens up and delimits a universe of possibilities and uh, that's important to reflect and in and, and Zaha's very much aware of that that's something we shared we talked about expansion of the, the repertoire all the time it's a bit like the toolbox you have I mean what was often not realized is that you know um, the formal repertoire is actually the problem solving repertoire and that's been one of my kind of key theses and mantras once you see that, then you realize that an expansion of a problem-solving repertoire is, uh, you know, something highly, uh, you know, uh, rational and desirable in the context of a problem-solving attitude. And we're not a kind of self-indulgent players, but 
we, we are playing in order to expand the repertoire, which we then have a bigger repertoire of problem solving. So that needs to be understood. And that has not been understood by the detractors of so-called formalism. So, and it sometimes hasn't even been understood by the formalists themselves. Uh, Eisenman and Kipnis who reject functional tasks all together and want to say that architecture is all about that innovation and playing and, and defi finding of new um, uh, spatial configurations and, and forms. I mean, that's a misunderstanding. I mean, that's more like the, um, it's a useful uh, fiction for the innovators in the formal domain that because if they don't have to think about at the same time about the utilization downstream, then they can be more radical and free, free freewheeling in their search. So there's a division of labor here. I'm just throwing this in uh, because when I was a student in the you know, mid eighties, we were hit by this project. Actually it was 83 when the project was won by, by Bernard Schumi. And um, it became, it struck us, first of all, it was a new set of new formal system and uh, it was also a new met methodology and, and it struck me quite quickly that it is also has a new uh, functional powers. Uh, but the thing was, these are rare moments in the history of architecture where you have a radical breakthrough. And the radical breakthrough here is simply what we at the time called superimposition of systems, where you have radically different spatial configurations. Instead of them being next to each other, they're just thrown over and <laughs> each other and they're interpenetrating. So you have multiple ordering system, reference system, spatial orders, you know, competing for the same place or being simultaneously available in the same place. And that's potentially very powerful programmatically, but also simply in, in, in terms of the design process, you can do that with lines and, you know, with, with the same tools you've always been working with. You can do that with, with you know, with the, with the ruler and the compass and the, and the, and the pen and, or, you know, with, with, with whatever tools we had. So, but the, 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 the let's say the social protocols of making a composition were radically shifted. So it doesn't actually be, d d depend on a new technology. It's just a new kind of, um, the rules of composition were radically expanded. So, and that was for, it, it sort of ripped through the field like a shock. So when we, that student discovered this, saw this project, and literally the next day, the whole school was trying this and doing that. And ever since this was an option, a new opportunity, and it was done a lot. Anyway. So the, the, this was another one uh, in a way, which is this kind of strange and, in, and you will see that Zaha was involved in a lot of these, but this is Eisenman. So Chumi, Eisenman, Eisenman was also the first superposition guy to some extent. So he's a great formalist and you can see how he, he was a great innovator. Um, this kind of strange uh, pleating and shifting and jittering um, and variation of a form across a field uh, that was uh, is, is very very striking. That's you know that's ten years later, new innovation which set off this whole idea of folding in architecture. And as we move from deconstructivism to folding as a first stage of parametricism, that was a, a, a ten years in, and that that's some of the um, projects. So and when and <laughs> when we thought of Columbia, this was in '93. We we did. You can see that here, we, we did this uh, by both by hand and by computer. We did this kind of gradient, the squeezing the distortions and, and shiftings and the superposition at the same time to generate something um, very exciting in terms of an, 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 an urban matrix or an architectural compositional system. So it has these two innovations. And it was for me always important that when we move from deconstructism to let's say folding or parametrism, what I call it later, that we don't lose that innovation of the superimposition of the multi-system condition. Um, we, initially, the innovation was the kind of transitioning and distortion, the gradual, the gradual transformation. But then it was also multiple systems, and they would inflect. They would kind of start to work with each other. They would, so the distortion, in a way, was you know, you know, picked up from Darcy Thompson. This kind of topological transformation, where the where, the, where all these fish species are of the same kind of topological order or body plan. 
And I mean, Greg Lynn was also his first year of teaching at the Columbia, Greg's and ours as well. And we saw what the guys are up to. And it was an interesting, exciting period where also the next year they had the digital only or two years later, digital only tableless studios. Um, so, so these were first computer generated um, uh, forms. And also what, 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 what I noticed was very striking at the AA in the same years, uh, also um, Jeff Kipnis had started the postgraduate uh, design group, uh, you know, where Michael Hensel and Tom Vera was so a student and I was a kind of keen observer of what they were up to. And these were hand drawn kind of uh, uh, urban systems, fascinating. So these are things which electrified, similar to when we, you know, the Chumi thing with the superposition game, this kind of blurring of boundaries, gradients, bleeding systems into bleeding was electrifying the whole field. And um, soft grids and so on, distortions, bundling. So, so this was, it, and you can see it, you can see it in a 93 at Columbia, um, what Hani and, uh, you know, Shuleta McDonald and all these guys were doing, and maybe Jesse. And one year later, or within that year, everybody was switching to this. Uh, and these were, these were great moments. So, so and then it you know, emerged out of the Eisenman studio with Greg was, was a student there and so on. But it was, you know, these things were compelling. And therefore, the, the, the whole generation just switched to that. Uh, uh, drop what they were doing were onto that. And that showed me how important it was. And the inspirations could be, you know, a little bit facile, like these kind of René Tom catastrophe diagrams, a mathematical theory of discontinuities. Um, 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 <laughs> uh, they were just forms which were drawn into uh, architecture. Also, the, the, the Luz wrote the fold, Le Pli. And Deleuze was very important, of course, with Thousand Plateaus. But so these are like super kind of strange alien injections. And the theory, the catastrophe theory had, had no bearing on architecture and no, none, no architect ever, ever understood it. Uh, but it was just running with it. Nor, nor did we have to understand uh, Deleuze's Le Pli. Or this, you know, this kind of fitness landscape. And then you kind of search for, you know, stimulations. This is this kind of strange kind of, uh, injection of alien material, but which which expands the repertoire, but it has something which which we're searching for, and 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 I have to also say it fits with you know the search for complexity, which started earlier on, which is maintained, and many other things. So so this is then later on, and you see how crude and simple, and playful these early versions were. Just to also of course the availability of certain software as we move from the first software. Of was working always these faceted pleats. It was the only thing which was available. That's why all the kind of the first folding was all these faceted pleatings uh, out of the Eisman Sudina saw it at, at GSD as well, 94. And then maybe a year later when the you know alias wavefront and the NERP modelers came on, they switched quite quickly as being you know more legible. There are certain advantages and appeals to this. And then the, these concepts um, were kind of run with this kind of idea of a continuously differentiated field or landscape and single surface projects and so on. So these are radical formal innovations. And there is formal research. And initially, just this, this is kind of a rampant plane for some of the protagonists. It remained, there was a refusal to um let's say instrumentalize or finding interest in instrumentalization and um asking you know the question of their potential superior functionality as urban formations and so on that wasn't on the agenda there was this american formalism and you had on the other side you had the kind of dutch functionalist radical functionalist who who were there was a kind of battle of two vistas and, and there was kind of programmatic research, the complexity of the modern city and so on. And I said, the DRL was founded on bringing these two together, by the way. Anyway, there was a show which, which we, uh, we curated at the time. And looking back, which is quite interesting, what I find interesting here is that uh, the, 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 the social 
let's say, detopolization of, of, of these kind of landscape-like forms actually was happening in the 70s. Uh, and that, that had to go along with the social revolution of the hippie movement of, of the relation between genders, the, the, the kind of free love and free um, ex self-expression and so on. And, and this was a, there was a social kind of um, meaning which quickly was rediscovered actually. Um, in this and and still uh, for me that that idea and is important. So when I'm doing a hardcore, let's say, social functionality research with agent-based erratic semiology, that research project, you see the forms we're bringing to bear are those complex, fluid, you know, continues to differentiate of forms because I believe that they're delivering more social functionality of the kind contemporary network society is calling for. You know, a, a multiple audiences, variation of, of situations, um, maybe overlap conditions between situations and so on and so forth. Anyway, so a radical, once the computer systems were, you know, they were brought in, I mean, it's, it's, Again, the, uh, there was importation of a lot of these, um, obviously, um, tools from the animation industry. Um, that's where these originally uh, were, were coming from. There's all science, you know, fluid dynamics uh, and simulation, et cetera, but mostly out of, you know, with Maya in the end is clear, but you can do all these uh, nerve surfaces, the blobs, the metabolites, you can do, hair and wind and smoke and you get all these landscape these fluid um formations and um anyway so i don't want to rehearse this too much but this is process driven so certain processes where you where you give a lot of let's say um freedom to an abstract machine to drive uh, the particulars of the final outcome and also the overall characteristics and then you have various obviously parameters to, to tweak and then there's this, so you generate these kind of um, uh, flows, which then translate into topographies, which then can be tr transcoded into these kind of voxelizations or more uh, um, detail. I don't have the, the full project here, but uh, you know, uh, different um, systems interflowing and you and and this is this is this kind of for, formal innovation, formal research, and of course it becomes is novel and becomes full innovative if you can convince clients, planners, mayors that these kind of projects have a deeper rationale, that the, the variation you can produce is powerful, that the adaptation to topography and the absorption of you know, rivers and, and, and irregular streets uh, flow, you know, come in. So that we did that at AADRL and then into the real world with Zadid Architects, where we win, won a lot of parametric urbanism master plans. Anyway, so, so in, of course, this is also an aesthetic revolution. So, so things look very different. And if you brought up on a certain, let's say, diet of masterpieces and, um, what you're pursuing in your in your design agenda and what you admire, uh, these things look very, very different. And uh, uh, there's a kind of initially maybe they look ugly or they look strange and bizarre. And uh, so you, you need to learn to like them. You need to learn to love complexity, for instance, which 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 was kind of tried to be reduced and 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 cleaned out in a, in a in a in a in a modernist minimalist kind of idiom. So we need, in a way, an aesthetic revolution so that we get the buy-in within, first of all, the professional discipline, but laid downstream, of course, also in the general population. And the aesthetic revolution is only justified not because we have something new and it's different and we need change, like we need a new fashion. We need, we need to move from kind of tight jeans to, to bottom bell jeans. No, because these new forms have superior urban architectural, social functionality. They are superior um, in, their, in their ability to, to, to contribute to societal progress, to productivity, to better, uh, richer and more productive life. So that, and, and if these, 
if the city which is, has this new vitality and you know you want to move into it, for instance, you want to move to a, to a kind of messy new district in, 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 in New York or to Tokyo, and it, but it's a, some kind of strange um, collage, which is ugly relative to the kind of pristine aesthetics of modernism, but the modernist pristine cities are kind of desolate and boring and nothing exciting is happening. And you have in the, in the, in the 80s and 90s, you have this kind of vitality of a startup culture, of a new entrepreneurialism, of a new kind of urban concentrations in these kind of strange collage cities, then you need to learn to love that. And then you have the aesthetic revolution. And that's the first one notable was the postmodernist revolution, this kind of strange love of pop, of collage, of, of strange juxtapositions, which then kind of was exaggerated into deconstructivism. And then the, the folding parallelism was another aesthetic revolution, but already within a, within a space of, with a new lineage. Um, so aesthetic values represent condensed experience and shortcut substitute analysis. That's what I'm saying. So before, when you, when you, were, when you were recognizing a, a beautiful, uh, you know, what, you know the, the, the building or the part of the city which you should have been attracted to in the 1950s and 60s was the modernist. You should have actually intuitively loved you know, downtown Chicago or something like that, uh, with the Mies Towers and so on, because this was um, um, the, 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 the apex of a kind of civilatory pro progress. Um, and uh, so, 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 you, so you, you, you have the right intuitions if you love that. If you still love that 40 years later, you have the wrong intuitions. <laughs> Because uh, th those are no longer, you know, um, where the where where the frontier. We're no longer at the frontier. There's a beautiful, you know, um, um, Dinkelo. I forgot the name. It's, let's say corporate headquarters in the greenfield, pristine. Uh, you know, a modern corporation in the 1950s, the apex of corporate um, sophistication and, and efficiency. And, you know, you know, 40 years later, you, have, you know, it's not it. You have to move to, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to uh, some kind of downtown process. Anyway, the rationality of aesthetic values is an important one and the need for aesthetic revolution. And <laughs> so this is always, you know, somehow the intuitive grasp of the high performance. Beauty is promise of performance. It's a prejudice. Uh, and, but we, we have to navigate the world on this basis of aesthetic navigation because we can't always have the time to critically reflect, analyze, measure, test. We must go by our prejudices and intuitions. The key is that we update them, that they are actually the right ones. So that you, for instance, need, I mean, this, this, this look, I mean, it's, it's just a high performance, but maybe it's the wrong performance. At this. Maybe we have to switch our, into our, our aesthetic value. I mean, you start to reject the left and move to the right. There's something different criteria you come to the fore. Anyway, so, so um, um, the other universal aspects of beauty, I mean, yes, I mean, if you just put, look at the human figure, maybe you think, but it's also there has been quite strong transformations. Um, in terms of ideals of beauty and so on. And the similar with the, with, with the kind of places and architects you should learn to love or you should kind of intuitively attach to seek out to know that you're in the right place, that you're participating in the more, in the better life. Um, and well, yeah, that's another <laughs> principle of mine. In the end, it's really what works. What, what is the true and maybe also the beautiful. But you can't deduce it. You have to find it also through an through in inverted commas artistic process. So what works should be, will be perceived as beautiful. In the end, it will catch on. And, and you know, if it's really compelling and more and more people get it and flourish, proliferate, and have you know uh, a better life in these environments, and that of course not only is you know the sh look and feel and the order and geometry and placement of these 
um, um, uh, you know, let's say districts and and buildings and so on. But it's also many other things. It's the uh, uh, you know your the social protocols, the your um, um, moral sensibilities. And you can, if you walk around with with the moral sensibilities of 1950, you're going to be utterly dysfunctional. And there's a similar, there's a parallel between aesthetic values and moral values. They need to they need to be adapted to conditions of high performance, of, and they are they remain pretty pretty stable in terms of this ultimately, in my view, productivity gains. Productivity gains are the ultimate power. Uh, criterion because that means that it's freedom. It's it's doing more with less effort and drudgery, and 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 that's what the productivity gains is. What what you know brings us to a point where we can you know communicate on our mobile across the world and 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 or, or you know now you don't do that. I mean, take a flight and have to have some a few naps and a few movies and a few delicious uh, meals. And you've just booked that kind of, you know, half an hour before you step onto the flight and you end up in Australia. And it's, you know, and it, I mean, this is the world, this is an empowerment of the human species. And it's compelling. If you can, put the, if you have that the command over that kind of, let's say, nearly God, <laughs> um, um, uh, subjection of the and, and, and surfing the, the forces of nature basically in, in with elegance and you know you can do it for another 70 years when you're 20. That's what compels everybody um, um, to, to seek out the ingredients that make that possible. And architectural, you know, urbanism, planning, architecture, design and industrial design, all of this is, is one set of ingredients. So we need to, in a way, aestheticize what, what now is um, and has its own kind of function and rationality. Um, and that's, a, that's the task of the discipline. So we need to become proselytizers and protagonists of aesthetic revolutions. And that's the great architects, the great innovators have, have done that. Something you learn, I learned by, and by the way, with, in the works of Fredo Trafuri, uh, his, his, his little book, Architecture Utopia, where he's kind of, it's a bit obscure, it's a bit pretentious. You have to kind of know what you are uh, uh, looking for, but you can find these arguments. Um, and it's interesting, it's kind of strange, um, Sometimes you go back into history when you when you into architectural history to find what the next stage delivers because you have to go somewhere. Uh, you can't kind of think it out of an empty head, which only is filled with the things, you, the precedents, and things you've seen. So you, what you've been brought up on. So you go back sometimes into history with complexity and contradictions, key phrases of, let's say, which became key. Postmodernism and then actually deconstructivism, uh, you know, that's drawn out of historical examples. And the similar collage city, Colin Rowe. And they looked at certain things like, you know, these haphazard uh, uh, agglomerated uh, uh, medieval castles where, 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 where each century something else was built and you generate some kind of um, um, interesting, adaptive, locally, non-preconceived, evolving build form, full of <laughs> complexities and contradictions, if you like. And uh, not intended, and that's, that's kind of then becomes a kind of paradigm for the way you should work. You shouldn't have some kind of preconceived vision. You need to allow these things to absorb contingencies. And in the design process, you also need to be able to add and subscribe. You should make open composition, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, I need to uh, go a little bit further. Himmelblau is one of those great kind of radical innovators. I mean, this this is the era of in you know actually urban reurbanization of the historical centers, and you do it with blunt superposition, cutting through, hovering on top, uh, hollowing out and refunctionalizing. You know, uh, and he said the aesthetic is the aesthetic of the uh, car crash. 
or even more visceral in the summer. Sometimes you need poetry. To, so you need actually not only forms, you need concepts. You need a kind of, uh, you don't stare only at images. You need to point to what it is in that image that you want to draw forward. That it is that clash, that superposition, that, that kind of uh, juxtaposition of, of old and new, of, of, of difference, um, that raw kind of, and so, so he um, said the aesthetic of the steering wheel that bursts through the kind of uh, chest, <laughs> the driver's chest or something. And it's, you know, architecture must burn. And he's, he was one of those, I mean, say, that's interesting. The architectural discipline, you need these, let's say, uh, raw intuitive geniuses who, who, who have also the, the guts and the, and, the, and the willpower to just follow the intuitions and do it. And uh, so in that group of the great innovators, it's a little bit, if you look back, the heroes of modernism, Mies van der Rohe, Le Corbusier, Grobius, who's a particular generation, and they were the radical innovators and they're very closely connected to the, these kind of artistic projects as well. Avant-garde, radical avant-garde. They then became the, you know, there's not, this is this decade, the 20s, and these people, and in the 60s, they were still the ones. Similarly with these characters. You know, if you think about the, you know, Zaha and Wolf and Frank, Rem, Liebeskind, I'm not so <laughs> You know, the great firms, you know, the, the great protagonists who've, 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 you know, but the interesting thing is in both of these, you have two ingredients. You have, let's some call him the intuitive geniuses, Wolf, Zaha and Frank. But then you have also, and they're very fertile and they have incredible egos and guts and self-confidence, um, which is only post validated. I mean, at the time there was no justification for the self-confidence. And, and um, you have, then you have Rem and Bernard Chumi and Peter Eisman, you have those who are still doing formal work. But they are the theorists, and you need that. They need they need to validate. They need to sift, critique, and tie back, and give concepts and working and terms to pick out from image to image what we're actually seeking. We can totally do it. I think it's very important that symbiosis. And you had the same in, in modernism. You know, uh, you know, you had intuitives, and you had you know the writers, and sometimes they're the same people like Rico. Anyway, I think, so Zaha was an incredible geniuses of breaking through um, uh, these things and, and Himmelbau as well. But they're also, they're, they're working at the same time. This is the 70s, the late 70s and early 80s. Um, oh, so, and the formalism, you know, these are radically formally driven projects. It's also the Lavi Lab competition where Zaha participated, Shumi participated, Rem participated, and many others. And there's all this kind of striation thing. And the, but the Shumi, and I'm just sawing the DOL, we, you know, it's, a, it's very different and it's a new phase. And uh, it's, it, it lasts much longer. The deconstruction was only a 10 year thing. And I'll come to that later. Uh, but the, the, the desire for complexity, the inter meshing of systems, um, the, the adaptation to, into existing condition, the absorption of historically, uh, uh, you know, existing structures into a system, etc. That's all uh, still there. And um, so it's a courage to set design free and it can lead to a surprising empowerment of the design problem solving capacity and and so you why is it sometimes like this is you have the general intuition this is about complexity and integration into existing contexts let's say which I already realized when she as a student or when she did in the late 70s OMA project this kind of the Hague 
Part of the Hague was this project where there's different building parts, they're quite different, set into an historic context with pieces intersecting. So this this emblematic, and then some you 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 you, you and you work with a Russian avant-garde with you know formalisms of a Malevich, of a Moholy notch, of a Lisitsky, the crowns and so on. And you revisit those, which went beyond, which couldn't be observed in the in the modernist era. But then you do it when you have to at the same time you you have problems to solve. You do it, you work on these forms, and at the same time now you have to you do competitions, and you know you want to use these forms, and that's when you they become tools by necessity because you have to make them work, and then you realize it that making them work gives you something superior to making the previous toolbox work. And you win competitions and you burst onto the scene and the success is a rolling story from four to 45 to 450. So, but this is a key phrase, formal repertoires are problem solving repertoires. An expanded form repertoire that delivers an enriched problem solving tool. Simply the quantity, if it's more, but of course it, it has to be also in the right direction. I mean, and you have to, um, but anyway, the, the, the simple fact that you have more options means you have more chances to find a solution already there. Um, and then I was saying these kind of incredible moves that are made as an intuitive genius who is looking at certain inspirations from art, from anything. And then uh, the way they got instrumentalized nearly uh, in the process of having to. And these are the kind of sync, sync, the explosion, calligraphy, distortion, landscape analogy. So, um, and what the explosion in a way does is, is fascinating. First of all, it opens up the space. So you have all these in-between spaces. You have these fragments, so there's complexity and variation, but there's also an overall thrust. Or it has a kind of centrifugal law of which ties it together. It's not a random garbage heap where 100 different people kicked and shifted it and it's, a, it's, it's under kind of a spell of a force which ties it together again. And um, so these are, these are these explosions opening up the block and, but there is some kind of dynamic, not, I wouldn't even say equilibrium, dynamic uh, physics. There's a, there's a pseudo physics at play. And that's important, physics engine, et cetera, later. But it's not only that, that's not in this case structurally or something. This is simply that the, that the formation has a recognizability gestalt and order. There's some kind of order which you can perceive. So it's, 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 it's not disoriented. And this kind of idea of an explosion where things fly off and there's a kind of the further away, the further they pull, the scale increases. I mean, these are, um, these are legible, compositions which have a drift, a directionality, maybe a, a, a center, they have a hierarchy and so on. Next one is a sort of strange calligraphy. And the, the, the power of this is the fluidity of the line which can now go into any neck nook and cranny can adapt to any strange urban context situation which can follow any strange trajectory between different spaces of different sizes and, and pull that through. And the, but the, there's also a pseudo physics here. That's why they look, they become so easy later, they're translated into splines because it's the velocity of the hand and the, and the, and the, and, and, and so, so these sketches are purely the hand, for, you know, the, it's the force of the hand and the, and the smear of the ink and the bleed of, is their physics processes. Uh, they're not invented, they're coming out of, of course, that. And that makes them also more poised, more, more legible, more, more, more order than you, you, you close your eyes and then you do a kind of jittery uh, sketch of wanting to do something. That's not, and it's fascinating, of course, with, 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 there's a virtuosity. So Zaha's talent, she could kind of start to hit these lines and fit them into context and, and do, and every drawing was beautiful uh, because it was like, you know, somebody who's kind of, let's say, who knows how to play the piano can dance. And then, of course, we went back and took this pretty literally and went back with a battery of French curves, which are kind of ship curve, uh, kind of a, a geometrically frozen splines and matching up these. 
Um, this strange idea, so it's radical and bizarre, I mean, that you could just do this willful uh, calligraphy and that this would be recognizable as a rational architecture, a superior rationality, because you, you, you can make a small subtle curve fit better, fit tighter. Similarly, with the explosion, if you do something which, would, which had you know, qualities which no other project had, and uh, functionally meaningful properties of orienting in a complex thing, which you have the simultaneously complexity and orientation, the fluidity of the hand, and distortion, something very bizarre, where you say, you know, in the way what, how it came out of it, when you do these isometrics and perspective drawings, you obviously, when you construct a perspective, you have the original orthogonal system, and then you, 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 when, you, when, you, when, you, when you draw them as a perspective, if you look flat on the paper, all these things are now trapezoidal and distorted. Uh, um, so then the idea was you could actually, um, these distorted shapes on the paper weren't representations of orthogonal things. They were actually now literally <laughs> distorted. Uh, in, in, in the real geometry. This does a lot of things. This can get, make the whole thing dynamic. It can be gradually more and more trans distorted. You can also fit something into a, into a, a irregular, again, uh, shape. And you can in, you know, enlarge something to one side and narrow it another. So this is another move you can make to adapt the building and the composition better. Uh, whereas before you, you, you do this, you would have to go and step it or whatever. So these distortions help. You can dynamize something and um, anyway, so, 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 so this is something, and then it becomes something you want to distort everything and it becomes a style that, that becomes superficial to some extent potentially. Uh, but again, it's discipline because you have to solve it then at the same time. So, uh, so, 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 uh, if you then kind of have to distort everywhere where it could also be a thong, then then it becomes going too far. But in a way, as I said, the kind of ninety degrees only one of three hundred sixty angles, and why privilege it? So, in a way, it should, everything should be distorted in the sense of being non-orthogonal. Uh, that accidentally the orthogonal is the right thing is would be accidental. So, you, you, why not have everything distorted? And then sometimes it's also forced perspective, and you can get this similar effects of the, of the explosion going. And the, and the one which was also very powerful was to say, okay, architecture should become like landscape. So dunes and, and river beds, and I mean, these are similar, uh, but, but you have fluid trans transitions, uh, you know, forests and hillsides, the, 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 the undulating surface and so on. So that was very powerful and came out of you know, drawing landscapes and architecturalizing them and embedding buildings into landscape and uh, then making the whole thing more landscape-like. And you get, in, you know, and that, that's, very, that's very important. And gradients, I mean, these kind of, you know, trans fading effects in the drawings were very important. And it becomes a kind of repertoire condition, you know, which can do very powerful things. So I think this was very productive and um, summarizing in here, these are the kind of, let's say, four radical moves, formal research, just formal mutations on the body of, of the disciplines, let's say, possible design moves. And now you have four, four categories of design moves, uh, new, uh, you know, and, and, and therefore you get something which looks like nothing else before. Look, but you can do, you can do something much more adaptive, much more subtle and much more superior, potentially. If you, if you have the discipline, you can think it through if you, if, you, if you want to, and if you have to, basically. And that's why we're winning a lot of schemes and you then also have to rationalize and explain that. And there, but there's also an intuitive, let's say, appeal to these things. Because we, we, there was an intuitive sensibility in our supercomputer of recognizing, you know, something which seems well embedded, uh, and also if you, which I realized, it's very important. Why we move from deconstructivism to, let's say, parameticism, and these kind of when we start to use curvature more and more in the office and gradients and more of a kind of elastic fitting of things, 
because of what I call maintaining legibility in the face of complexity. So we realize when you do these deconstructivist compositions, it becomes chaotic and illegible very quickly. But you want to have all these different entrance points and different sizes, and you want overlap. And if you overlap many, let's say, uh, angular things, you get a kaleidoscopic nothing. If you overlap nice blobs, you get a, you get something legible. So nearly to the point where you can say that we just intuitively realize through looking at these drawings that 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 the more fluid the use of curvature was delivering something better for us. And nearly you could say you, 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 you can find your own, I mean, when you look into the drawing, you get lost in your own drawing. You don't know where you've been drawing yesterday or what you've been drawing uh, three minutes ago. Uh, then you know that, that this is a problem. So there was a kind of, um, in the, in the uh, a migration when this was into this more and more, um, fluid work, which later on, when we had the tools, became parametricism. But a lot of them were prefigured in, in, in hand, you hand work. Okay, so art. And I was saying before that this kind of radical formal innovations, they make the, the, the spirit and attitude of the protagonists and the milieu and the, the discourse is similar to art. And also, these works initially can be, the art world is recognizing them and displaying them and gives them some validation where a client wouldn't touch it. So the art world is that kind of incubating space. Um, so instance, no, you know, MoMA deconstructivism 1988, you know, that's MoMA, uh, you know, which, which launched this movement. And Zaha, we had lots of, uh, you know, um, interest in the art world and it helped giving us a platform, helped motivating us, helped uh, financing some of our efforts. Anyway, the, it's, in terms of this topic, formal research, the avant-garde, there's no way that you would, that the architectural modernism could have emerged the way it did without abstract modern art. So it's an absolute instrumental. Now I'm showing you works which later on still had fertility, you know, um, um, and uh, what had immediate fertility was you know, the work of Mondrian and the style. Um, anyway, so I want to first show, but, so, so, but this kind of world, this kind of art, is something radically different as a social institutions from the older arts. And it's a kind of strange historical emergence of something we now call the art world, which still most people don't understand. Still remains a puzzle. People look at contemporary art, they want to look at it as, as like the, they want to look at it as, as the art of maybe a, a Rubens, a Rembrandt, or a Raphael, or so. And to so so and then they sometimes don't you know they worry about the skill level that, that the lack of beauty <laughs> the lack of meaning um, um, so so it's still misunderstood because it's a very puzzling um, institution which came about um, accidentally it's an accident strange accident of history was like most radical innovations are kind of strange accidents of history. So the old arts, they're important. That concept doesn't catch contemporary art at all anymore. So, so you had actually you had painting, sculpture, and architecture. And let's say painting and sculpture are still the kind of classic domains of the visual arts. They were totally integrated with architecture and they were utilitarian enhancements of real lived spaces of architectures, right? And they were utilitarian. And if they were illustrative, then they were utilitarian, like now uh, um, a documentary, TV documentary, or, or a, 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 a magazine article, an illustration is, is utilitarian. And uh, anyway, so, so um, these arts now continue to exist 
in the mass media photography, I mean, with a social function of informing, of, of creating an, an ambience, etc. cetera. Um, and, and the art world is something very different, absolutely radically new and never existed in the, in the, in the uh, before. Um, because the art contemporary art has no immediate usefulness. It's actually the radical rejection of any usefulness of any instrumentalization of any thing. Um, and the, so the question is what's the societal function? But I want to go back and show you that, you know, the great artists and artworks of the previous eras, I mean, first of all, most of the, um, they were all in one symbiotic, condition there, they were all creating together, for instance, the chapel, the palace, um, the, the um, council house, the elders, and so on. And there were the same people, Raphael, or Michelangelo, or all these great architects were also painters and sculptors. Bernini, um, it, it goes for everybody. I mean, you can see, you can, uh, Leonardo da Vinci was even more things, but uh, so he was, Raphael did these works and um, painting was, you know, one more utilitarian element in, and they come together. But modern art is, is radically new and, 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 and something different. And it happened to some extent, I mean, is is to do with photography coming in and in a way um, pulling away the uh, raison d'etre of, of painting, killing the raison d'etre painting and also the new media magazines and so on and using photography and and nobody goes into a, um if you want to learn the you know the, the history look at a kind of illustrated history book and not go to a palace and look at the history you know these these big paintings laying out in 12 episodes the history of of whatever so so there's there was a whole industry with the high prestige and uh, earning power uh, made idle, and they had to look for, they had to be refunctionalized. That kind of capacity and and social status, they, were, <laughs> they had to desperately find a kind of new outlet and a new social so, social function. Anyway, so so anyway, that that led to also this reflection that there was no utility, so there was a radical rejection of. Um, um, any social function. So the idea of La Pula of you know this kind of aestheticism of the of the 19th century was some kind of uh, coping with that, turning a calamity into a, into a into a positive kind of project. And uh, anyway, what I'm saying now is this this art world serves a function, and no modern you know and continuously modernizing and innovating society actually would do well without this realm. Because, because that's where you have that freewheeling experimentation and brainstorming where most of the new technologies were, were experimented with. I mean, um, um, you know, internet art or, you know, kind of interactive uh, installations, contemporary, you know, or AI, what you can do with it and couldn't do it. And, but also in earlier stages, industrial, you know, tools and mechanisms what can you build? So you create kind of strange constructions or constructivist artworks, playing around with materials. And, and this gives a space for it because nowhere else would you be able to have the patience. You, they don't, these things don't function. Internet art isn't a functioning internet tool. You know, it's just exploring stuff. So, so how could that exist? You have an audience where you can test a little bit or some financing or what? The art, art world is that space and it actually has a lot of money because the strangely has that old nimbus of the masks of the artist. I mean, these guys have, they're, they're clowns, they're kind of imposters in a strange way. You know, Damien Hurst, who's just following his weird intuitions and somehow managed to gather resources to do big things and they don't fulfill a proper purpose, but indirectly they do. So it's a, it's a, it's a strange, irrational, yet rational. It's the brainstorming chamber with a lot of money, space, attention uh, to do stuff, which maybe is only redeemed through later utilization. And of course, most of it isn't gonna be utilized, like in a brainstorming session where most, most of the ideas are trashed afterwards. So, so and, and, and the real users 
and consumers and audiences for these should be the creative industries. And there's no point in, you know, herding uh, school children through this stuff or tourists who, 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 who have no reason to understand what's going on and have no projects which need formal inspiration or spatial inspiration, but it's also inspiring, you know, instit you know, institutional mechanisms of communication, of sensibilities and all of that. There, that might work to some extent, you know, but, but this is video art. It's a classical one. Um, nobody's watching video art. Uh, you can't sit through this stuff unless you're a filmmaker and you're excited about the minute of the certain effects, certain formal effects, certain, uh, you know, um, uh, things you might instrumentalize for your documentary, for your full length movie. And, that, and you do have some careers of filmmakers starting with video art because you don't need to have a full mastery yet. You don't need to have, a, you know, these huge budgets. And the same with a lot of architects go into that world. Most architects, uh, their careers start in the art world. Anyway, so art only inspires, never functions in any way. And you can't discuss it like this. If our works shown in the art context, um, it's no place to talk about it. It's your future utility purpose. It's, it's, just, it's just differently discussed. And there's a strange kind of, what I call, and the sociologist was called it latent functions. If, if the, the function must remain latent. If you spell it out and make it manifest, then you're looking for, in the artwork already, it's future instrumentalization, and that kills it. It's like putting a chest on your, you know, pistol on your chest. And what is this good for? I mean, that's what, the, that's what a lot of the culture by now is not doing. I mean, people who do this, we know they're aggressive and they kill art, so that's why the art world this is the worst kind of person you never want to have around. But that would you do if you would make that latent function manifest and make it explicit. You, you know, that, that, there's a kind of strange, uh, interesting dynamic. There's a lot of social, societal institutions and social institutions. That's why the category of latent functions is a standard sociological category where, where the whole function, functioning relies on the fact that it's unacknowledged and under the radar. And if you would spell it out, you would kill it. And the art is one of those. So it, we must have systematically a false consciousness. A necessary false consciousness is a phrase I'm, I'm borrowing from Marx, where he had actually insights in another uh, context. Um, so the resolute rejection of determined purposes and of being measured against performance which we often frustrates and angers onlookers. However, this resistance is a key to its latent hidden societal function. And we have those characters, I mean, uh, um, in our profession who, you know, like Jeff Kipp is an Eisenman, who just categorically explicitly reject to be looked at like this because they know it's the pistol on their chest. But I think it's, I take this kind of different view. I think that is somebody needs to then look at it this way in the creative industries and bring it in. And um, I've seen my role like this and I'm, there, there, are, there are a few others as well. And I think guys don't be panicking. A lot of what you're doing is sustaining that pistol on your chest. And you have, we have answers and your stuff is incredibly fertile. Maybe you are not able to say that because people have different talents and different capacities and backgrounds. So they know they can never defend what they're doing. So they say, I don't have to. And if, because if they, if they, you know, if, if they would try to, they would, they would start kind of losing faith in their own project because they, are, they can't do it. Maybe I can. Anyway, so there's an interesting <laughs> set of reflections. Um, this is this kind of strange thing where this bifurcation Painting and sculpture and what we call the arts were actually arts and crafts, were something which now exists in industrial design, graphics, film, photo, et cetera. Um, and the art world is that totally new thing. Um, but there is this kind of tie back 
or it becomes a brainstorming chamber through avant-garde designers who, who can dip into its resources and pull this across or do stuff which they call hard here and later on do the real thing as well. Or colleagues do the real thing. I mean, we have quite a few of those colleagues who are actually in our discourse, but economically, and they have this double life. They're living in the art world, and I'll show you some of them. So um, anyway, I, I have to kick this cle clearer, quicker. I mean, this is for me the classical examples. And it's interesting that the, the, the pure artists is, Mondrian is a mysticist. He has no conception of his own role in the world as it took shape later. He's just doing stuff intuitively. And similar Malevich, these are, it's interesting because they're, they're mystics that is kind of, they, they live in an otherworldly condition and they need a Theo von Dursburg to, he's the, he's the one who organizes the style and he sees, you know, that this art should become the world, should become life. And similar figures, Gropius and the Bauhaus who brought all these artists. And that's strange, you know, have you seen a kind of, Joseph Itten, I mean, they're, they're monks and they're the kind of maverick, bizarre figures. And they, 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 they've been kind of forged together by a, a Gropius a Van Dersburg. Um, anyway, this is, sorry, I'm mixing this up a bit. These are all the, the domains of necessary societal functions, which feed through avant-garde are fed by the art world or need to dip and use art world as a resource of early research. Um, okay. So here's another one. I mean, this is Mondrian. This one was coming at the same time, but it wasn't, translation didn't happen because the world wasn't ready for it. So there's always this excess. You know, there's only 5% which was utilized, but that means it might be utilized later. You know, 50 years later through, through Zaha, when we had new issues, new problems, more complexity, etc. cetera. Um, actually Malevich, his own translations were strictly orthogonal when he thought of architecturalizing them in the tectonics. Then you have these strange. These are fascinating. These are the prawns, the, the, the Lisipsky prawns, later Moholy's work. You can see here, there's also things in there. Some of them are translated, some of them not. These strange angles, the superpositions are there, um, which modernism didn't use. They went more with the, the style thing. And you can see how strongly the style has influenced Mies, the brick house and the Barcelona pavilion, just, you know, totally playing off a kind of Mondrian composition, you know. Anyway, so, so going back to this, for Mondrian to via Van Dursberg to Rietfeld, and then we could say that's the societal function of art to produce this, that's redemption. Because somebody staring at this and getting a kind of high is not justifying, you know, the best, a large part of the best and brightest of the generation doing this stuff. This is a justification. A new spatiality which, which generates, you know, so many buildings in the 20th century. I mean, this is a small house, but let's say, you know, the, the National Theater in London is a version of that. But it's also interesting, the internal kind of flexibility has become the topic and the kind of abstraction of the surfaces and the kind of multiple utilizability is still grown, burned down though. In fact, in the, in the modernist era, you, you have no, you have typologies un, untouched in a way. There's tables, chairs, houses. Um, it's, it, there's not a radical typological uh, transformation. Anyway, so Dursburg with Van Esteren, with Riedfeld, he's the, he's the, he's the, he's the, the great visionary organizer and well and this was talking about this earlier this is Mies Kiesler three-dimensional they also you know spin off dreams into the spatial city which comes out in the 60s later 
And this, but this is what was happening, first of all. And these guys were the ones which were weeded out. They were also there, the expressionists in, in the 20s. So you have in the in those art proliferations, you have this huge excess. And because of the alertness and the task domain, there's a channeling and a, and a certain kind of tra trajectory uh, which things which work and you could a civilization could run with. And that's what's weeded out. But you can see the characters. It's fascinating, the difference between a Gropius and an and the Moholy Notch and the Nelisitsky and, and the artist. I sorry, not the, the these two. <laughs> Itten and this is Bauhaus, Itten and Schlemmer. And these are the these are the sharp minds. I mean, this is um, uh, Hannes Meyer, radical functionalism. This is Moholy Notch. Forgot who's that is. Um, it's probably Lisitsky and Gropius. He was a kind of mastermind, you know, the business person. Uh, yeah, this is, so it's nearly, uh, this is all, this is the artists. And you can see where this goes um, sociologically. This is clownery. This is surrealism is the, is the kind of, or Dada. Dadaism is the emblematic um, uh, art movement still to this day, which is absolutely emblematic of the culture of the art world. And I'm still doing this to compare. <laughs> you know, it's like, this is social division of labor. I mean, there's unimaginable that they're, they're very different cultures. But the avant-garde designer is somewhere between, I mean, let's say like this. Okay. So I'm just going to go through some of these I mean, radical images and paintings and this kind of interesting overlaying. So how was, this was a radical innovation, of course, and I told you, it's, it's, it leads to the, the, the Chumi project, the Eisenman project, a lot of Zaha's work in the 70s, early, very early work as a student was based on this. It's, you know, it's fascinating. Um, and this is Moholy in the 1920s, I think, or yeah, 24. And where did he find it? I mean, there's always some source. It's, it's the kind of multiple exposure photography he was experimenting with, I guess, which brought this on. So a lot of these discoveries are excellent, but you need to have a kind of alertness on the painter looking for new stimulation. And then you have him in the 40s, more holly, and they become you know, instrumentalized for some kind of urban condition when you can see the game happening. And this is, you then have Zaha, you know, these interpenetrations and layered layeredness in her student project from, the, from 1977. And then 1979, 80 in, in, the, in the competition work. Chumi, 81, he did this kind of strange Manhattan transcripts. Uh, he was a little later on this. And then, he, but he did the, the most striking thing, let's say, which sometimes you, he's not the first, but maybe the most kind of um, there's somebody who's doing it in the most effective way, where before you didn't get it, maybe we were all, you know, we, 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 maybe we flicked before through books and saw a kind of drawing by Peter Eisenman, which has the same principle, but it didn't hit home. This one hit home. This is the Eisenman version. Maybe it should have hit home as well, but anyway, it didn't win the competition. Chumi won that major, major competition, and Zaha won at the same year, the peak, by the way. And then we, we, we kept doing this stuff and this Eisenman as well. And, but what is important for me, let's say my trajectory and say, okay, mm -hmm. the theoretical parallels and underpinnings, how it ties in with the project like uh, Christopher Alexander, City is Not a Tree, where, we, where he's talking about the overlaying of catchment areas in an urban district, where they, where they, where, where, and, 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 the, I, the complexity of a layered social system um, with, 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 with overlap interpenetration of domains of, uh, of social circles, you know? And then you realize Zimmer was talking about the modern society where you are at the, cent 
we are individuals because we are at the intersection point of many social circles which don't are not concentric. They overlap. We all have uh, multiples and we have the intersection point maybe with the number of small people of these. So, so these, so maybe then a building should look like this. And I looked at corporate um, organization and found that these kind of concept of multiple affiliate, multiple belonging to different, you know, a functional division and, and, and dissection and a team and project dissection, for instance, a disciplinary and a project. Anyway, it was fascinating that is somebody like multiple readings of a graphic of an artwork become an emblem for Christopher Alexander for this principle. Anyway, so, so, um, Forwarding this, so, so in my whole discourse, I, I, I come to that later. This is all these, the, the, you know, the, the radical avant-garde architecture using new forms, new processes. And where does it appear? This is the Art Biennale in Venice. These are other exhibitions, Serpentine Pavilion, Miami um, uh, Art Basel. So it's the art world where these things come forward. Um, this was a show we did at the MAC, uh, Museum of Angewandte Kunst. Um, these things were ICA, Institute of Contemporary Art. So th th this is all launched within the art world. I mean, certain time pavilions still. Um, uh, shows which we did, I forgot, at the Gu Deutsche Guggenheim. Uh, Guggenheim itself, we did multiple shows there. So, so, so. <laughs> uh, the art pavilion, uh, uh, you know, the Chanel art pavilion, um, galleries like Jumozinska and, uh, you know, contemporary art galleries who hosted us multiple times. Um, and then, you know, I don't know, Grumatsi Kola, university, of course, as another arena, and then playing this, bringing technologies and generating this formal research, formal systems, formal possibilities, but then there's also interesting functionalities which can bring to that. So that's the world, uh, again, Biennale, of course, and then shows which we create again, a new Metatopia show. I mean, with the, there's kind of a slightly newer tectonism and discretism, whatever research was a different world, different from the earlier parametricism. And again, you have the proliferation of forms, new technologies, robotics, components, 3D, 3D printing, um, all the um, optimization tools. So there's a, there's a, there's a new kind of world, tech, call it tectonism now, which again, what we're really interested in, yes, there's a high level of rationality, but also a new level of expressiveness. And it becomes also this kind of artistic toying around with these things in the art world or in our gallery and other galleries and so on. Um, and so uh, I was working on, these are snippets. I was working on a big permedicine show, which never, happened because I wanted to do it at a MoMA. I thought it was necessary to be in the MoMA uh, to have that lineage of you know, the, uh, the, the international style, deconstructivism, parametricism. But when I did this, I looked at the characters within our own field who are using the art world. It's radical design research, technologically driven, uh, uh, of course, Mark, and uh, he's super successful in the art world, but his discourse is 100% within the architectural world. So I've been teaching studios with him at GSD, obviously he was working for us, and then he set up his own studio, but he, and he's trying to migrate from that scale into the larger scale. So then there was these guys, I mean, he, I don't know if he was originally, um, um, a, an architect, but but anyway, he is a uh, he computer, let's say, uh, the programmer and software developer who's using the art world to fund this stuff. Um, and there's 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 all of these characters, um, fascinating stuff. And some of them, you know, we use that they're, they're not architects per se, but we bring them in or the architects and they are, again, um, because this work isn't yet scaling, isn't yet, it, it's still formal research, 
if the expansion of the repertoire and they don't have the capacity to translate that, the opportunity and the capacity. That's why it's important to have a, you know, larger firms like Zadi Architects where we have that capacity. Um, and <laughs> Daniel is one of those, and it's my interpretation. So, <laughs> and um, so, the, so the question is, you know, that formal research, new, radically new processes, more in terms of image making and composition. And, you know, is that, is that the moment? Is that still the moment? Uh, is there a new moment, a new discovery? Where does it leave? What is the instrumentalization? You said once, I'm not interested in using it for, well, I, sorry, I misspelled that, using it for automation, but you want to, you said maybe augmentation, upgrading of design potency for innovation, right? So, so, but then in the background, there's this image of, I don't know if the, if these kind of, what do you call it, the, 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 the deep himmel blau, uh, is it innovation or is it uh, automation of, of, um, so it's a question, a bit of a challenge to you of generating more, um, maybe slightly more intricate himmel blau projects and you, um, he, they would be recognizable in the oeuvre. They have the kind of similar gist and, and recognizability. Et but anyway, that's that's only one of, of the researchers. So, and and that would be this kind of idea where you can automate actually the, the generation of new um, new faces or of through these kind of cycle guns. Um, or you can make, you know, this is not an innovation. This is just the automation. You don't have to grow that beard and make another photograph. You just generate that. Um, so these are examples of automation and automation is powerful. I wouldn't, you know, I understand that a, an, 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 an ambitious aspiring architect building up a career and profile doesn't want, of course, only be automation because automation is actually you, you, you to develop a design system as a service and and, and it's not nothing. That's the one challenge is uh, um, um, we were looking at later on how you, you know, there is an element of automation is always good. Um, and to some extent, when we moved from, from these hand drawings to, to using, uh, let's say Maya, this was partly just an, an acceleration, doing the same thing quicker, but it was also pushing it and making it refined. That's maybe what you can do with the deep himmel block. Or is there something more radical on the horizon? More like say the initial breakthroughs of that um, cast of characters, which we talked earlier about, uh, of a Zaha or something. Anyway, I just want to also say in terms of uh, this general automation thing was uh, shape grammars. Um, and you can, you can generate compositions and initially they were abstract. Uh, but you can then generate many versions of that. And, but it was also then quite quickly, it was, it was random stuff, but you can also kind of generate all, you know, 50 more Frank Lloyd Wright houses, or particularly the prairie houses of the Frank Lloyd Wright, with shape grammar. Or, and you know, thinking back of the Palladian villas, even without the computer, you could have, you know, once you've developed the underlying grammar and system, you could then generate, um, and so you have a sample set, the Palladian Villas, and then you have a Witkova analyzing this, and then a, a, a George Stein, he shaped them, put then also program the Palladian Villa and gen automate that. And it, of course, they're new villas, uh, you know, because of the combinatoric richness of the underlying grammar. I mean, uh, you know, it's like Chomsky has, has emphasized, you know, the power of this grammar is this, let's say, the that, that there's sentences, you know, they always generate new sentences, inverted commas, but they're not that new. And so, so there is this also, the, this is a system that's using neural networks and AI to automate something which is very difficult to, you think it's trivial, but to do a, a, a relatively large single family house for a kind of American suburb, which has maybe 15 rooms, several, you know, porches and gardens and patios and several bedrooms and kitchens and dining rooms and so on. And the relationships between those and the bathrooms and 
is non-trivial and a very experienced designer can do that and then fit that also into the, the you know some pre-constrained overall sizes and so on so they had they built these kind of neural networks to to develop these layouts and i've read this article this paper and what struck me is that what seemed to be very simple and trivial how hard it was to get this satisfying and how many iterations it took to get something which an experienced designer would tolerate. Uh, so it's, but it's, it's working from this big sample set. So it's very similar to training of the neural network and somebody probably sifting. I don't know. Uh, it's worthwhile looking at it, but, but what was interesting to me was, you know, there is, you know, 100,000 iterations. The, first you generate the right relationships and then you comp. It, it, the final thing is to shift it and compact it into an output form, which is more acceptable. And then the final thing is to put to put these kind of roofs on it. That's more trivial. And then, uh, of course, you have these processes. I mean, they're powerful. And, and, and I don't know, you know, uh, um, and of course, there are commercial applications for that. In terms of generating new faces and uh, having fun with how you're going to look when you're when you're when you're 80, or and now it's just one way of interpreting what you're doing here is um, so going beyond. I mean, it's one way to say it's an open-ended process of inter interpreting these strange outcomes. You do something more strategic. I think it's a strategic view where you're saying, okay, I like there's a kind of meaningful tectonics of the Gaudi, but it's quite constrained to a typical, you know, nave and symmetry and seriality of, um, of, of the underlying composition. And it has the intricacy and, and novelty in the tectonic detail. And now you want to give that a the global composition, make that more complex and see whether these you can still resolve and have the tectonic being played over a much more complex plan let's say and i think that's interesting and, and these are by the way i'm, I'm showing it's a compelling achievement i think this is i thought this is very powerful you could do that these images are very convincing but also i can see that being the um, the rational task for this but then my challenge to you is, okay, fair enough. But to some extent, the problem you, if we have that already and it's been solved in different way already. Namely, for instance, the Philip block with compression only vaulting. I mean, he could also, you could do one thing more in particular with respect to um, a, a Gaudi. Uh, so he took, learned, you know, the, 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 the logic of these vaulting, the way the tessellation fits in, and the way they have a compression only th th thrust system and the way the static graphics was used. And he was able to free that, uh, in, uh, free the plan, free the composition, which we need in, in contemporary world and resolve that and resolve it beautifully with the thin shell and the tessellation comes out of it and so on. So, so you have the tectonic detailing uh, in terms of the particular curvature and flow and granularity. So, so that's what you've done. If you've done all of that, fair enough, it's maybe powerful, but um, um, maybe the other, so I'm saying general, uh, you know, shape grammars could do some of the automation claims. This one could do something of the more complex, let's say adaptation and upgrading claims. And now I'll just throw this in a question mark. I mean, what do, what, what do these, um, Matthias isn't here, I don't know if you can, Talk about it. Um, I mean, uh, you, 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 you. It reminds me very much of the of the eighties kind of explorations of, of strangeness and what could be known. What how could we interpret this? this is quite fascinating with this poche and boring and the kind of strangeness of the of the forms and so on. And there's a kind of game of appropriation out of that. Perhaps. I mean, what is different here though is that he's used these kind of for me, obscure and difficult to grasp and follow through. He doesn't work with images. He actually worked with some kind of textual process. So, so that isn't 
But the question I'm having, the challenge is, are we looking for that known unknown, basically solving the kind of Philip Block, like the, what you've done, I think you've kind of, if, if I interpret you right, or what you've done with the Gaudi process, is you've solved the known unknown, the particular solution to the pr question, which we could have stated and Philip Block has solved in his way, and you solving another way, maybe of more potency because you can, it's more the varied, but then there's also further downstream work. Or is it the unknown unknown, which is which is um, a bit more this kind of, you know, where where a monger didn't know which problems he was even working on. So maybe that's and sometimes you can you can and there's movements in art and architecture who who are pushing this and saying you know, and and you know shying away from that knowing already. They're just celebrating the unknown unknown and, and the surprise and the otherness and strangeness. But I don't I wonder if that I mean but then you have 99.9 or 99% chance of missing 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 the target and, and remaining kind of on the fringes. So novelty is always possible. And there's no exhaustion in my view of the universe of architectural forms. It's less clear radical innovation can be on the cards in, an arch in architecture and the current historical situation. That's the other thing I want to say. So, you know, there is a reason why, let's say the Bauhaus and these artists, they hit off and became founders of a new universe, which rippled around the world and generated 50 years of modern architecture with various subsidiary styles and sort of brutalism and so on. And high tech, but even if you look at the high tech structures of Pompidou and, and you look back at Chernikov and so on. But there were no other avant garde of any significance in the interim. 70s, early 80s, let's say, you have a new set of crop of avant garde powers and they are unleash something new. Now, my interpretation of this. Um, there's historical conditions where this is on, you know, paradigm shifts in societal dynamics, structures, technological setup, sociological dynamics, you know, and, 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 and then you need to pose the problem of the built environment anew. And you also have new problem solving tools, for instance, the computational potential. Anyway, so the question is, can you actually hope for the unknown unknown uh, and that radical transformation be that, can you hope to be that radical figure maybe in the 2020s? This can only happen in the, you know, the 2050s onwards when there's another radical shift. And the question is, what is that? And I have some hint. Anyway, so there's, there's another challenge too. For your own reflection, where you where you sit in that. Um, I'm talking about cyberspace of maybe being that, and that's what I'm working on. That, but I'm not bringing new formal resources yet. But maybe they're coming out of the playing with these tools, uh, that new fusion, etc. So there's maybe maybe something on the, happening, but I don't know. But I have no new uh, at the moment. It's a, it's, it's using parameters and tectonism to solve to, to attack that because of nothing else yet. So maybe your stuff can jump in there. Uh, but but this this is the back on is maybe this idea that we have epochal styles because we have epochs, societal epochs, and uh, then you know if can you found a new epochal style if there's no e transition of epochs, or is whatever you're going to do be a new subsidiary style, which is possible, like. You know, brutalism with modernism, high tech with modernism, or the trans, you know, transitional was, uh, you know, if, if there is a new epochal style on the horizon, maybe it could be first only transitional style and then migrate to become a new uh, epochal style. But you need to have, you need to talk about epochs. Um, and if there's a new epoch in view, probably not. And I said in parameters, we have all these kind of even put, let's say, the work of Jill and these guys, discretism into the into in the subsidiary style. 
and there's good reasons for that. And if it if 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 it collapses, if it isn't that, then it collapses back to some kind of minimalism. So so I'm just showing that, for instance, that it, there's those people who pretend to, to tell us there's a radical break. We reject the continuities, parameticism, and so on. But I think it's 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 not. I, I recognize it fully as a as as a subsidiary style. This kind of amorphousness, the fluidity which comes out of these when these parts are small enough to become swarms, uh, even if they're if they're very self-similar, uh, uh, and there's a certain rigidities in the system. But uh, it's 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 discourses we had many times: the more the formless, the more the own form in the history of parametricism. Um, so so these 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 so these are for me subsidiary, uh, you know explorations, uh, at best they're subsidiary styles. Um, and, and also this kind of aleatoric, making ambiguous of the topologies, uh, you know, this is very similar to what we've been done for years. And, the, and this idea of um, the amorphous, the formless, the, the, in using the kind of, well, the, the, the seeing something as something kind of, working with abstractions and strangeness to then inspire our supercomputer here to make associations and see and find things is, very, is, is, is at play in like here as it was in very strongly at play in the, in the early days of deconstructism and, and parameticism. And also I would put into that the whole, um, let's say, um, I'm showing this stuff because it's this particular, this is the, the SIAC stuff. It's in spirit very similar to I would say the AI research of you. It's this idea of radical explorations, very, uh, of openness, of strangeness, of otherness, of inexhaustibility of the objects, the hermeticness, the obscurity. And I've written on that, and you can find that. It's this idea of what Deleuze and Guattari called the virtual, that the yet to be, the, the becoming, the space of becoming. They make it as if it's something, you know, the whole triple O, object oriented. Ontology kind of discourse into architecture is for me a total revisiting, interesting and necessary, and maybe it's a productive of that whole world we went through in the when we when we in the in the late 90s, early 2000s, also with hypersurface, with the idea of the virtuality, the, the virtual house competition, where we talked about the excessiveness, the, 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 the complexity, the inexhaustibility. Anyway, strangeness and um, don't want to go too much with drawnness, hidden depths, inaccessibility, surplus, the excessiveness of the material yet to be interpreted and so on. So that's something you know, maybe a world which is also a, a theoretical kind of a world which you could inhabit. It's a little bit what I first, when, when, when I see Matthias talking about this stuff. Um, anyway, and uh, you know, there were stages where we also were exploring this and it's, it's always, interesting to have that re-injected, I think. Um, uh, the question is, uh, when we've gone through this, how much um, ground can we shift? The hope is to have that radical breakthrough into some kind of otherness, which is at the same time superior, radical innovation. So the question is, that's the quest, or is it? I leave it with that question. Amazing. Thank you, Patrick. I mean, this was like, uh, I never uh, seen you presenting things in this way. It was like amazing. Um, so before I start to address those kind of, those kind of questions, uh, I would still like to allow a few questions from the students. And then maybe we can also engage briefly on those, those uh, questions that you, um, you raised. Uh, I see that the first question here in the chat is from um, Jessica. So Jessica, if you are still here, Jessica uh, Urkoli or something like this. Okay, so if you if you can ask your question. Yes, so uh, my question is, um, do you believe that moving forward in architecture um, that technologies should always be implemented? Or are there moments where we can neglect technologies so that we don't lose the human aspect of architecture? And if there are moments where we can fully rely on the human mind, like what are those circumstances where technologies could be abandoned? Well, no, I think um, we need to work on the height of available technologies. 
um, with our, um, let's say, intelligence design processes and you know, computational processes mainly, so AI. I think that if we, if we should be aware of this and some pe people should explore this and what it means. I mean, there's various forms and ways of, let's say, computational intelligence which have been in the, the, the field for a long time. This initially was generative, now it's also analytic and let's say validating and simulating it's my research in social functionality simulations this is absolutely important that we we're operating at the height of technology and there's no rejection of any technology and the and the fear that it dehumanizes no i think we, that that's precisely humanity it's that open-ended project of of um self-transformation and world transformation and so technology is nearly the defining ingredient of a forward projecting progressive humanity. So that can, and that's a big problem in, the, in this discipline that there, there are these pockets um, or within the field who think that they can dismiss technology, that they can put this to one side and they can operate without it. Um, um, they, of course, when it comes to certain technical competencies, they accept it, but um, it kind of, you know, maybe some of it is age, some of it is what they've invested in and they're defending it. The difficulty of upgrading, uh, you know, these are all kind of excuses and let's say a mechanism which prevents some parts of the discipline to embrace and fully participate. Uh, but I think it's not something which you could deliberately uh, do. It's a, it's would be a self mutilation. You maybe rhetorically defend this position because you have to rationalize your incompetency. You are not competent in these technologies. They're too tough, too difficult. You don't have the resources, so you you want to defend what you're doing. And yes, there, of course, there are still many issues and problems and designs you can compete with without sophisticated technologies. I accept that simpler projects where, where, where also the, the client isn't demanding something innovative and, and, and cutting edge. So it's a run of the mill kind of projects can be, still be delivered in more traditional ways. But, but uh, for the discipline, to say it should stay away from these technologies is kind of suicidal uh, for the because the discipline as an academic uh, um, uh, discipline, but also with professional leaders and an and, 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 and avant-garde uh, uh, and institutions like the Venice Biennale, etc. It needs to it needs to fulfill its societal I think task and purpose, which is to to be in charge of the continuous innovation of the built environment with respect to the evolving and progressing societies and human project. And, and to do that without the latest and probing the technologies which sh show themselves to be very effective and potent in many other domains. That is just um, self, it would lead to the, in the end, to, to irrelevancy of those protagonists. So, so there's no, there's no, um, uh, in general, that needs to be embraced and worked with. And of course, case by case, we have to appraise, uh, you know, with respect to the particular resources, timeframes, budget, problematics of a project, how much, uh, what technologies are brought to bear. But 10 years down the line, certain things, um, which are now kind of at the edge, will be necessary ingredients of any project you can no longer fall back behind it. For instance, you know, they say maybe 15 years ago when you had some complex infrastructure products, you're running agent models for the, for the circulatory flows. Now you have to have it on every project or certain environmental calculations and so on. These are easy ones. And so that's, an, uh, you become backward. And, and architecture is sometimes um, the preserver, you think the real, um, yes, engineering, yes, I accept that with engineering, but architecture is, has this kind of artistic element that is the inevitable. It has to do with taste and my subjective appraisal, but I want to rationalize also aesthetic values and tell you, for instance, that you ought to upgrade these aesthetic values because they make you reject the vital 
the functional and you walking around with the wrong tastes is is making yourself dysfunctional relative to who you could become uh, if you had if you had better let's say more upgraded and updated tastes similar with moral sensibilities there you would accept it probably if you run around with 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 with, with, with old moral sensibilities you're going to be uh, you know offending people you're going to be inflexible you, you're not going to perform well and as uh, you know you you're kind of an elephant in the in the in the glass shop and but i would say that the same thing is less maybe sometimes less obvious is with if you run around with the wrong aesthetic values with something which isn't all together uh, non criticizable so yes and technology belongs to this as an inevitability so and that's why one argument for instance in engineering a lot of people accept that but now I have to tell you one thing: um, the um, all the sophisticated engineering optimization um, tools, they, they can fully they can fully come to flourish, flourishing, and the full let's say power of saving material, burdening and footprint in the world is when you have non-orthogonal solution space. When you have basically the aesthetic principles and sensibilities of parametrism. That style is the only style that can truly absorb all the engineering adva advances. And all other styles, in a sense, are a strange compromise. They're, they're actually working with the engineering rationality of a different era, where you couldn't have final element analysis, where you couldn't have topology optimization, when you, when you couldn't fabricate also uh, more, more adaptive uh, things. So, so, so the, the, the use of the technology is then also becoming a necessity because you can do these sophisticated products by hand. And uh, so, as I said, there is an ideological stance which some people take. It's a rearguard stand, and I think it's a rhetorical defense of incompetency. Thank you. Um, yeah, because I, I guess the standpoint where like my question comes from is like, could um, creativity lessen as we start to be more reliant on technologies to the point where like as we move so futuristic that we're incapable to think as creatively as we used to. So that's where, um, that's where my question No, I think, I think that's the opposite of the case. I mean, I feel that um, the first, a lot of these technologies help you to, you know, to unburden yourself from routine exercises and they, you expose yourself to, to, to more variety of, of options and you can let your imagination flow better because our imagination, I mean, I think we misunderstand our creativity in without stimulation and accumulation. And we also neural networks, let's say being, you know, without the kind of data sets and stimulations, we, we, we kind of empty, <laughs> we just reiterate what we've seen. So, so, so the fact that, um, that working with these technologies, you, you can see so much more. And we need also the, these media. So you staring at an empty white sheet, you, you can only come up with, you know, what you've seen. It's not, it's not the creativity is sometimes vested in the process, in another alien process. Um, you know, like for instance, this idea of automatic writing and the surrealist came up with the idea of suspending this kind of deliberateness of the, the Deleuzean abstract machine, this kind of working with algorithms and finding things because you couldn't, you can't produce them, not only with your, because you can't produce them with your hand, you can't imaginate them. You, you simply, but, and that we, particularly when you want to concretize this. When you work something, you know, elaborate a complex design without having a medium, a drawing, or a model. Now, the model is much more sophisticated, and particular parametric models. You you simply you simply falling back on simplistic things which cannot be creative because we're reproducing, let's say, primitive things, and that's non-competitive. That's not so you you probably overestimating the creativity of your own mind, and there isn't that much in an individual mind. It's in you have to plug yourself into systems, and you absorb a lot. 
but also power yourself through systems. And, and uh, you know, so, so you know, it could be also feeding into a neural network when, you, when you're on Instagram all the time. You know, this is also something which makes you more creative. Is that technology? Um, you know, I accept that those things are also important. And, but, but I think there is not um, a kind of genuine, um, unfettered, inborn creativity. I mean, there's different talents, I accept that, in terms of the hardware. But really, you have to think about the software that, 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 that you... And the, the idea of the extended mind is quite important. And Neil Leach was talking about it all the time. That, that, that you know, you, it's the, the creative process is one where a number of brains are plugged into, with each other, into systems, into a discourse, throwing words around, looking at things together, but also running algorithms and looking at them again and so on. So it's, it's, it's you know, it's an extended mind um, where, the, where the external systems are a very, very necessary ingredient of a, of, a, of, a, of a higher creativity. And even if you look at uh, Leonardo da Vinci, the way he's actually produced this fantastic landscape behind the Mona Lisa, for instance, he didn't invent those. He looked at an external machine, inverted commas, which is you know, the physics of water patterns drying up on the wall and generate kind of a natural formations as kind of material computation or an algorithm of a physics. And he then, in, he could then paint over those. And, and, and that's the, crea the creative. He could have never done that by is it in inverted commas out of memory or something. He needed that external machine. It's a simple, and then Max Ernst did a lot of that stuff with Portage and Decom, so called Decalcomanie, was pushed, you know, you know, two oil paints between glass surfaces and get this fantastic liquid, uh, filigree um, uh, formal structures. He, he, he then kind of incorporated into his painting, a similar effect. Thank you. Thank you for your input. <laughs> Thank Don't you. overestimate your empty mind. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, um, <laughs> I mean, if you look at like old architecture before technologies even existed, I mean, we still consider that to be like great architecture. So I just think about like in present. Yeah, but it wasn't. It wasn't invented. I mean, that's an interesting point. These vernaculars, they're very sophisticated, but they're not uh, the inventions of designers. There are hundreds and sometimes thousands of years of an evolutionary process, which was distributed in time through constraint and trial and error. There was nobody in inventing. They were just uh, building on, 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 on what they've seen, but it was weeded out through um, um, the vicissitudes of you know, stability and, 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 and functionality, which was more superior. And so there was a discovery process. All these vernaculars evolved in a process which didn't involve much, where the component of conscious, deliberate uh, decision-making was minor increments. So the same like all the organisms of the world, the way they evolved, there was, there's no mastermind. Um, that's the way all the vernacular traditions evolved um, with a little bit of conscious um, um, uh, intervention, but not some foresight, not a single, even in, in the Roman, I mean, uh, nobody ever designed a complete, um, you know, even Gothic building. They were, they were, they were, they were all kind of, I mean, but also to have that techniques and they, they nobody, was, there's no inventor of that. There's no, uh, everybody was just doing a version of what they've seen and what they've always done with slight changes, sometimes randomly hit upon. And those which were successful will continue. Those which didn't successful were weeded out and pulled back. Anyway, so there's no, there's no um, creative mind involved at all, uh, nearly in generating of these uh, traditions. 
exactly the way no creative mind was involved in the generation of any organism. Uh, Yakmur, can you uh, can you ask your question? Yes. Hi, Mr. Schumacher. Thank you for the great lecture. Um, so you spoke earlier about these superimposing systems and collaging and how that um, creates superior functional and social solutions. Yeah. Can you speak a little bit more about the social advantages or disadvantages about those um, in your yeah. opinion? Yeah, yeah. And for instance, let's take an example of the, um, the principle of this, the, the, the park to live is an interesting one. So it's, let's say you have a park like that. And um, I mean, by the way, it's also that that kind of park isn't the high functionality system. It was more of a manifesto project already, but the, the example is this. What I'm saying is this, you oftentimes have, an, have um, um, spaces mm -hmm. where you have multiple agendas playing. And that's typical for the contemporary world because you have many different audiences who are with different agendas. They want to have different events. And if, if you have the superposition, then you can have, I mean, you, you, you saw, for instance, there was a squiggly line running through the whole thing. And that gives a series of, you know, a line with various points where you can maybe meet at this or that point for individual meetings. You have lots of pavilions, a grid of pavilions, each individual different. There you can have to meet with small groups. And then you have these larger spaces uh, where you can have larger events. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so you have, you, and each of these, let's say, or functions can hook onto the structure given to them mm -hmm. and orient towards them. And the other structures are just background noise for them. So they're focused on a particular structure and order, and that's good enough for them. And the other ones, because these, these for instance, these big circles and triangles are never fully closed, but, but they're good enough if you have it only hinted at with a few fragments, a circle, a kind of open fragmented circle is good enough to, to, to create the sense of a circular space in which you can meet, for instance. Right. And then if there's a few pavilions in there, maybe you can overlook those, they become background noise. And the squiggly line doesn't become a threshold for you which divides the space. You overlook it too. So you have multiple reference system, multiple orders, and that is meaningful in a, in a society where you have multiple simultaneous um, gathering and interaction scenarios, which could play literally at the same time, or you could say the one is, you know, there's the evening version and the more, and the during the week version or the, uh, the weekend version, and you don't have to change over the scene that's already baked in and picked out as needed. I mean, you know, the, you know, these, um, they do it often in schoolyards when you have a, a, a sport field and there they're painting on it, superimposed, the football field, the basketball field, you know, the tennis right. and with different colors. So it's maybe slightly, this could be slightly dis distracting, but in the end you can run all these different games. So there's a multifunctionality potential in the same space. There it's not simultaneous. Um, but in urban spaces, you could imagine that you have these superpositions of these three or four games and they all play at the same time or sequence of time. So that's the, that's the um, po functional, social functionality potency of this. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Yagmur. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, Zishan to ask a question. And, and I want um, to add, add to this. So some of the people who are interested in this didn't, they didn't mention that. So that's something which I add to the mix because these guys who did these formal experiments were more like formalists. And they were just interested in the thrill of that. And then the painters who work on this obviously don't have such a mind. So, so that then the, the, some of us then start, Chris Alexander was the inspiration for me, myself, and I don't, I only, I don't know anybody else, <laughs> who then kind of rationalized that, you know, and then I compared also to something like the, the corporate organization, the contemporary high performance corp corporate organization has multiple, let's say, uh, decomposition systems at, at the same time. You, you belong to several reference systems. You could show like this in a little, anyway. So but not one. all of the protagonists 
some of the Pakistanis see it as just interesting and kind of like art. But I think that's obviously, um, you can't do this really. I mean, the Kipnis can say that, and Eisenman can, they can tell us that we should treat architecture like this art. But can you imagine that we are actually taking kind of the shared surface of the earth and huge resources, and then just having a kind of playing kind of artist, not caring about, the, you know, that this is meant to, uh, you know, this is obviously preposterous. Uh, you can't really propose that, but that's the way they're thinking. And that makes them the better innovators. And they, they, the better, let's say, artistic uh, proliferators. But it, it is impossible to be the stance of the, uh, of the discipline, this kind of la pour la. Um, we are going to continue with a question from Zishan. And uh, David Rivera, I think uh, your question and this, this sounds a question is quite quite similar. So I hope that this is going to address also your question. So uh, Zishan and afterwards uh, Pro Professor Vermiso, and then we'll have to uh, wrap things up, okay? So Zishan, you can ask your question after you, then Professor Vermiso, and we will start to uh, wrap up then the, the meeting. Yeah, my question was regarding about where you're talking about art of the past and saying there's information or works that were rejected at the time. Uh, it was created because maybe it was too creative to understand at that point. Um, but now we look at it today and treasure it. What do you believe is the rejected art of today that will be tomorrow's treasured work? Or who? Interesting. One of the examples I mentioned was, you know, let's say the, uh, the Russian avant-garde. Uh, this complex composition of a Kandinsky, of a Moholy, of a Malevich didn't come through in the in their era, right? Um, it was more the the, the, the art of, of a, the style, for instance, and and um, um, other forms of uh, abstraction. And then this was rediscovered. That's the example in in the era of deconstructivism, when this suddenly that complexity was more called for and 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 more also already happening through the spontaneous collaging of the of the city whereas the modernists did the, did the substitution the greenfield city the 70s starting to be the so that's that's an example and there, there, there could be others that there's this kind of i don't know um i mean to some extent zaha then called this what she did there, she said there's the unfulfilled project of modernism. So she called, she saw, you know, there's a part, you know, yeah, certain parts of the modernist artistic project didn't, weren't coming through into architecture, urbanism and industrial design. And um, so, so I don't know. I mean, um, it's, it's, there are obviously sometimes these transformations take a long time. So what I think, for instance, what I'm working on is we have now since, I think at least 20 years, we have these installations in art spaces where you, where you have sensors tracking, let's say, uh, visitor movement and doing something with it, or you can gesture and something reacts, something, something in the space changes, so these kind of, a, let's call them responsive environments. Now, I've, I'm on to this for a long time. We, we, we did kind of functionalize, rationalize, putting to work these systems. So why is it, you know, as an artwork, they actually never really work properly. Um, so they, they, they also, there is no proper point. They don't have a task because when I'm going as a visitor into a gallery, they don't have a task. So they can't actually, but they're more about the, the, the opportunity and certain ways and tropes of sensing and actuating. So that for me is, a, is an unredeemed artistic project. And there are many, you know, there are hundreds of those. And I'm concerned why we need to bring them out. I mean, there's this person, architect I'm working with, Jason Bruch studio, and he's been growing. He's doing this, inter and they're doing, he's doing them more in urban and public spaces. That's a step forward, but there's still curiosities. Then not put the work, and that's my project. Nathan and Diran, you know, responsive environments, which now become kind of 
create a spontaneous environment because I don't want these things to only react, but I want, I want them to, to kind of interact and actively um, offer themselves or change the situation for us. But you need a, you need a programmatic functional context in which this means something and contributes to the overall performance of the social uh, processes inside. And that's what I'm working on, for instance. Uh, um, and that's an example. Awesome. Thank you. Professor Remisa. Hello, Mr. Schumacher. Thank you very much for uh, it, it was a very loaded and definitely stimulating lecture. So there, there could be different questions, but I'm personally interested in design creativity. So I just mm -hmm. want to go back to a couple of points you made earlier uh, where you mentioned that our design process always begins with this a priori existing formal repertoire and also later on that the aesthetic value system the existing aesthetic value system can kind of substitute analysis which means that it could become this sort of delimiting uh, factor so my question is do you feel that design creativity in the work both of uh, i guess Zaha Hadid architects but also uh, in a broader context depends on treating the conceptual, formal, topological discovery independently of, rather than because of pre-existing constraints? For, for example, will the moves of explosion, calligraphy, uh, distortion, and so on that, that you mentioned operate better outside the applied context, only being able to refine their act after they have broken through this kind of first conceptual barrier by needing to become buildable? One second, sorry. Um... Well, I, I'm not sure uh, where the drift of the question is. Um, yes, I mean, um, the, by the way, this kind of in, seeing it as an instrumental uh, set of moves is retrospective, uh, recuperation of accounting for what we've done, how, why we invested so much in this, and why we've been successful. Uh, that's also something. So it's not something which, and then the attempt to see more strategically in the next round what we're doing. So, so the, the, the breakthroughs, um, um, I think there is, uh, as I said, they, they were matching a time. They were matching also as an intuitive absorption of conditions um, of, of this kind of new complexity, that interest, that interest in, in drawing and in, in, in the field. And the buildup of of, of um, uh, that that whole experiment within formal research, what was happening in the seventies. So you participate there, and you want to contribute to that initially, and you don't know. Uh, the Zaha didn't know why, and 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 that this there wasn't a, a strong emphasis on functional functionality, but that then came in by force when you actually confronted with having wanting to win a competition. So that's the way this comes in. The, the a priori is always there. I mean, um, but because and, and we don't reflect it. And, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a limitation, but it is also a facility, of course, that you have that, that you know what to start, that you, you, know, you could otherwise, if you, if you didn't have a pre-constraint, you, you, know, you, know, um, you would, and that there are too many options you, you, you would have to consider so you can't make the move. The moves take too long. So, so the a priori is always there. The important thing is to then kind of to reflect that. And if you in a, when if you race to that level of consciousness, wanting to work on that, wanting to uh, expand that, critique that strategically. And again, you can't just say, "Now I'm I'm, I'm setting myself free and I could do everything." You have to. It, it's just expanding and, and reconstraining it to be actionable. So that's one thing where, where the thing is important to realize that pro is always there and you can kind of, you, sometimes intuitively expand it, you can also consciously expand it and, and you can, it's never to be overcome, but sometimes people are blind when they, when they pretend that they're only focusing their mind and only working on functions. This is what they're focusing their mind. They're only talking about adjacencies and and, 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 and circulation and so on. And then when they draw rooms and circular journeys, they, they, they limit themselves by, by an a priori which are never reflected. 
and they think they're optimizing, but they're optimizing only within the within the within the search space. So that has to be overcome and critique. Now, um, and of course, buildability. I mean, issues can feed in as well, and you can pre-constrain them. So, so I think there's also this thing where 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 you where you make the exploration, and uh, it was more wild, and then you working through. And you find things, and you had discarded a lot. When you do the similar project next time, the the, the search run, if you, you can find the, the shortcut, that path can be reworked, so it becomes routinized. So this idea of let's say the Deleuzian kind of exploration and aleatory exploration, as the career matures and as you find your new path, you don't. I think go away from that and, and, and throw yourself into new venture every year. You you kind of then streamline and routinize and stabilize this, and maybe at the frontier, at the edge, you you, you add in more. So so that's another thing. I mean, when you're historically mature, and you to a point later on where you also you 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 you've learned a lot of downstream, and you bring that into the front. Everybody says you need to consider at the beginning all this. That's good when you have a relatively stable, you know, when you want to do a mastery piece, when you want to do highly competitive, uh, difficult and complex project, and you want to master that, then you need to rely on a lot of, you know, it has to be your 50th project. And you have already, you have a lot of anticipation, you're pre-constrained, but this can only happen, you know, you either rely on this search process of a whole generation you, you've learned from, or you've gone through your own. I mean, we've, but with Zaha and us and that generation that we've gone through our own kind of trajectory and filter and use our own reference system as a shortcut to the, to the, to the solution. So, so that's another mechanism. And the question then is historically, um, um, uh, you know, me said you can't invent a new architecture every Monday morning. He had that sense that they have hit on something. They're finally 150 years late after the industrial revolution has kind of full on taken hold of the world. They have kind of found the, the architectural, let's say congenial paradigm that matches that. And they felt strongly and rightly so that architecture was kind of lagging and was maladaptive, was anachronistic, was had, had kind of backwardness. And they bring it forward into it. But, but, but so then it's really cumulative and refinement and, and you can't, that moment you can't have 10 years later again, because, you know, you need to be in synchrony with the world <laughs> and the world has, unless the world has moved on. Um, and, and of course, this transformation was also that the, more, the you know, the world had gone through radical transformation in the 50 years, but then the, the you know, the, the 10 years of the, let's say, the, the First World War was a big kind of bust up for many things. So it allowed a lot of the disturb. So that's what my historical thing is. I'm not sure if it was in your question, but, but um, so the a priori is there, it's reflected, you expand out, and you don't know if it will become, what of these explorations will solidify into a new canon. And it was interesting for me that the new that the new canon is also an aim of your consciously have, and in a way you could see that um, the international style exhibition at the end of the twenties. If the twenties were that great explorative decade, and at the end you'd actually had filtered and matured something reliable, and you could formalize it. And that's what they're trying in the book, International Style. You know, Russell Hitchcock and, and Philip Johnson, and I subscribe to that. For me, it was also a model. That was the model for me to say I'm doing that with parametricism. I'm, you know, I'm doing that for the new uh, uh, revolution and transformation. And at when it had crystallized ten years on, which and at the beginning I don't know. I mean, if I was when I was a student I, and you do you just you you brought up on the modernist kind of thing, then you see Fry Otto and these projects in Stuttgart, and so then you see postmodernism coming in. And then you see, de you learn deconstructive and Himmelblau. And then, and then you see, um, a, a few years later, you see, you know, Eisman and Greg Lynn and, and this stuff. I mean, did I know, it looked like there's so many things and so rapidly changing. 
I would, wouldn't expect that this now was uh, different and would, would run for 30 years. But 10 years in, I realized, hey, this feels very different. When we were, you know, this was actually longer. I, it, it, first of all, I thought that the electrifying moment of, you know, the early 90s where everybody came online. Then we found it here in 96. And then I reflect that 90, we had 10 years DRL, which was a little bit delayed, 2007, 2008. And I reflected, wow, this, I was surprised. We are working on the same ideas, the same concept, the same categories, just more refined, more precise, tried out in many scales. It's just very matured and not jumping from postmodernism to deconstruction, to fly out to, to this and that. So that's where I realized, and, and I compared it to the period before, um, that you need that. And then I was interested more in my project is you say, this is going to continue for another 20, 30 years, and, it's, and uh, we need a, a different discourse. And it's not, and the, these historical periods are, are unique and they have different cast of characters. Anyway, so, so that's, I don't know if it answered your question, maybe partially. <laughs> You opened up many more, but that's a good, really good thing. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think um, it's an amazing discussion, and you can uh, continue like a lot, a lot. But it feels almost like what you are talking about. It's almost like um, we we had this discussion at one point. I think also in uh, FAU a DTS program about types of creativity, and we were talking. Uh, from the perspective of the Misasades, like when talking about uh, neural networks, he's defining them as they have types of creativity in terms of interpolation, extrapolation, and maybe, maybe through innovation, yeah? And right now, what you are mostly talking about is almost like it's a sort of still interpolation process, but that's not to say that just because I'm interpolating with it my, my own like uh, system of reference, it doesn't mean that it's a bad thing necessarily because I'm just refining in a way and I'm just perfecting in a way that, that kind of uh, uh, solutions, the solutions that I'm actually uh, trying to, to output there. So I think that's, that's an interesting thing because we, I mean, we have yeah, this- I mean, in terms of the, the, the systems you're exploring, it's quite interesting, of course, because you're relying on data sets. So I mean, you, and that's something, you know, in theory, there's, two, there's attitudes to this. One is it comes along with a lot of rationality and that, let's say was the guys who tried to automize or, or capture and give a system that rationality, which is at the moment non-explicit and inarticulate. That's most of neural network projects, you know, speech recognition, speech generation. So it's this kind of automations project. And that's actually where this technology comes from. And you have to kind of reflect that fact. But where it becomes creative and other is a strange kind of the hybrid hybridization, the kind of style transfer or the mixing of ingredients and uh, the way you set it up. So, so is, the question is still, you have to ask, you know, am I in the game of, I mean, if not automation, do I want to capture the rationality? And can I capture two rationalities? What would that work? Should, would they have to be congenially co selected? Or do I want to generate a mutation machine, an abstract um, inspiration and proliferation machine. And I thought when I, when, 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 you know, your Gaudi project is not that. That's why it also generates in itself already valid results. And it's not just something which is a raw material for further elaborate rationalization so much. It still needs that. But so that's already a result. Whereas when I th think about Matthias and these, uh, his approach, it's more the approach of generating otherness, a raw material of intricacy and strangeness, and all the rationalization is still, I'm not interested in any other rationalization uh, that comes with it. So I just don't know. I mean, both is valid. They're both examples. Now, I think the, the Matthias thing is the, is the, works in the revolutionary period. You needed that in 1918, 19, 19, 19, 20, 21, but in 25, it was already you know, over. The, all of these artists were thrown out of the Bauhaus for good purpose. And Hannes Meyer, a rational mind, you know, with these, with these 
new repertoires, was, was doing kind of um, real work. So, so the question is, where are we? Are we in 1920 or are we in 1930? Or are we in 19, let's say, uh, 90 or are we in the year 2000? And it's very different. Um, um, and, and that's not depending on you guys. This is depending on the world. <laughs> so my hypothesis, you know, we are not in that moment of revolutionary transformation. I don't know. But there could be an argument because the, the, the COVID and the, and the so 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 that's why I'm saying okay, I'm going to work on this cyber urban fusion, and maybe we have a very different. We, we have a lot of kind of tailored presencing and, and being in several places at the same time and highly technologically. I mean, maybe there is stuff, but I don't know yet what that means for the built environment. Um, I mean, is, that task is new enough to say. Uh, so, so I'm in two minds. I mean, because I have that now, maybe we're also be in that revolutionary world. Um, but it's it's a it's a, it's a it's a guess. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, but maybe you don't, if you feel if you feel very potent, you can also say I make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, mean, I don't know after those shoulders. Yeah, so I think you're also addressing this kind of idea of uh, shape grammar and so on, and also deep on blah, like uh, how we approach those things. So um, um, our approach is like we are really trying to look at um, architecture as a system and uh, really try to address, like when we talk about this kind of neural networks, we're not thinking necessarily about what you see behind. The, uh, what you see behind me right now is just uh, just one one of those multiple systems in a way that you have in architecture. This could be, let's say, Gestalt only. Yeah, it could be something that maybe you, you just um, use it as a, as a mode of, of challenging perception of or challenging this kind of like preconceived ways of designing. But also that thing, like similar with the Sagrada project, it doesn't have to be understood as uh, I'm just mashing in a way data sets together. There's also a, a intricate process behind like uh, how you explore some ideas, how you uh, perhaps uh, look at uh, semantic features that are represented through these kind of images. How can I emphasize, de-emphasize certain things? Like how can I explore design from that kind of perspective? How can I have a model that learns or it's active design model, let's say. Yeah? And for me, this is something that I'm very interested in designing. The sort of thing is this, I think, uh, Daniel, I mean, it also depends on your, you know, your age and where you are in the world, in your career development, how much time you think you have before you want to hit home. Yeah. So <laughs> if you have a lot of time, then you can take that risk and be more radical and more explorative and say, I don't need to know what it's going to be. And I'm just doing stuff without knowing where, where it's lead. And you can do that. And, and you also have an environment, obviously, in which that you can, if you, if you, you know, sit in an academic situation and so on. And uh, or if you if you had something more strategic in mind, uh, you know, let's say following on from the Gaudi project, um, and you wanted to build a firm around that, and you start start delivering competitions and, and so on, then there's a different time horizon. You you, you know, one thing is 30 years, and the other one is 15 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, of course, there's no guarantee. Uh, but 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 the, the you know the 15 year project is probably you have more. Um, chances to succeed <laughs> that's true uh, yeah unfortunately we'll have to uh, wrap this up so we are almost like three hours in which is amazing oh, okay. i mean okay. i mean with uh, with patrick he's an amazing uh, amazing person like you can talk forever and, and i think patrick would like to talk like forever and there are well, so it's many been rare actually that you get me that open-ended space of time usually yeah. i've been kind of in recent and I get a sense that this is it. This is it. it could be more expansive and conversational here, so that's good. Yeah, so that's that's the reason why I, I let it go like longer because I was like, this is amazing. Like I, I never I never saw you in a way presenting the history of things like in this kind of way and how you think about certain topics. So I think this was a very amazing like layout of uh, laying laying out in a way all these uh, ideas and concepts. So. I think everyone here is uh, uh, extremely grateful for uh, you accepting to be here and uh, really offering uh, your time in a way to, to give us this kind of like uh, uh, 
discussion here. So um, thank you, Patrick, a lot. And I hope that yeah, we pleasure. can continue. Thanks a lot for, for the feedback. Great questions, guys. And let's stay in touch. Let the communication go on. Yeah, let, right. let's continue. Let's continue yeah, this yeah, conversation. No, no, yeah, yeah, Come back next week. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Yeah.